Welcome back to Woodlawn Talks. This is your host, Pastor Jerry Carney of Woodlawn Church in Columbia, Mississippi, and this is my best day yet. Whether you are a first-time listener or you are a return guest to the podcast, thank you so much. You uh, you make our day. This is the reason that we uh, that we do Woodlawn Talks is to be. Uh, an inspiration, just something that we have learned in the past, an experience that we've had, or to highlight a guest that we have here locally at Woodlawn. And today is going to be a fun day. You are going to be blessed by my friend Kay. That's all I can say. You're going to be blessed today. And uh, she is going to share with you just her heart for the lost, and relive some stories with you that she has uh, encountered during her missionary travels. And uh, I just can't wait for you to hear what she has to say. Before we jump into that, uh, next month, starting in September, in fact, it's September the 6th, we are going to be doing a video podcast as well. And uh, I don't know if you like video podcasts. There's there's people on both sides of the aisle. Some are audio folks, some are video, but we are going to be starting a video podcast here at Woodlawn Talks. And and uh, if that is 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 how you like to uh, consume your knowledge and and podcast, please jump on that video podcast. We'll be advertising it as well on our social media page. And uh, we just we just love investing back. We love giving back, and uh, you make that possible. So join with me today as we welcome our friend Kay to the studio. Welcome to Woodlawn Talks, a bi-weekly podcast where we give a behind-the-scenes look at who we are and the strategies we implement for weekly services, big events, and leadership goals. My friend Kay, it is so good to have you back in. Columbia, Mississippi, and back in in the studio with us today. This may be your first time. It is my first time. We haven't done a podcast together, but uh, you're just a, a blessing to the kingdom, and, and you're very special to us here in Columbia. You have a ton of friends here, and uh, I know it's good for you to be, be back, but for us, it's just a special treat. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule and your your travels and all that God has for you and uh, sharing with us this weekend. And uh, I just want to just jump in to a little bit of, of your story and and uh, just how God has opened doors for you. When did you first feel your call to, to missions? Can you just talk about that? Like what doors open, what doors closed? What did that look like for you? So... Whenever I was 14 years old, um, I've loved the ministry my whole life. My parents were pastors for several years, uh, most of my life. And whenever I was a child, I knew that I loved ministry. I loved um, watching them in ministry. My Both of my parents speak very well. And so I knew that I wanted to be in ministry, but I didn't know what capacity I loved to serve. I loved always just being up at the church, just doing anything that that was needed. And so whenever I was 14, we were at a conference that my home church hosted every January. And there was a preacher preaching, and the title of his sermon was Menus Without Prices. And on this menu that he handed out to everybody, this, these little cardstock cards, I think I still have it, it had all of these different types of ministries, and I only thought as a kid, you know, you could only do music, or you would be a preacher, or a youth pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, or you were a missionary. Like, those are the only categories that you could ever be used by God, <laughs> ever. And so... Choose then, one of these five. Just yeah, check circle the one. That's right. <laughs> and I saw on this menu that there was so much more than just your cookie cutter five. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing those other five ab- absolutely at all. But I started looking at all of this, and the Lord uh, spoke to me and, and really lit up the the line that said speaking ministry, because usually I had seen, you know, you have to be a pastor or you have to be a preacher, but I'd never heard it just put just like that. 
the Lord really illuminated that, and then he spoke to me, and he said, you will be a speaker by the time you're 15 years old. And I turned um, 15 six months later, and so I was like, this is going to be a quick work. God, you got to get busy. This is a six-month miracle. And I'll never forget, just at the altar, I said, okay, God, what, whatever you have for me. And I didn't have really any um, influences, like female influences. Yes, I had older women that were significantly older that I that I saw growing up that spoke and you know like you go to books a million and you see Joyce Meyer on the cover of something but like I didn't I didn't know that that could happen to a 15 year old and so I I held on to that I didn't tell anybody and um the next month rolled by and nothing happened and the next month rolled by and nothing happened God you got four months left four months left I know it's like God's on a timer can you believe that and so in my in my 14 year old brain I was just like God you know you said this what what's going to happen and a Sunday school teacher that really loved me I'll never forget her she came to me privately at about month 4 and she said I want you to come and speak at this youth retreat. I think you would be the perfect person. Wow. And I'll never forget that was just that was the moment where I was like, okay, God is really going to do what he says he's going to do. And so from there, um I didn't I didn't feel called to one specific lane, but anytime someone asked me to do anything, I would yes. say yes. Anytime someone would ask me to come and do anything, I would say yes. And I'm very thankful for people along the way that ask me or saw something in me that said, "Hey, she can do a creative spoken word here. She can she can do something. Maybe she, maybe it's not like a preaching thing, but she can she can do this. She can get everybody on their feet. She can be an MC for this event. She can do this." Woodlawn even did that for me whenever I think I was 19 years old. And you guys saw you were you were one of the people that saw something in me. And so it wasn't necessarily one of the things where I heard from God and I only did that one thing. Yeah. It was God asked or told me that, that I was going to do something, and I just continually, my responsibility was a yes to everything that would open up. And with that, I got to see things that I didn't want to do, you know, or feel called to do. I swore up and down. I told my mom, I said, children's ministry is not for me. And she said, never say never. <laughs> and then when the opportunity for children's ministry that it came came to us, I, I swore even then, okay, I'm never going to do anything else but children's ministry because I loved it so much. Then an opportunity came in for junior high ministry. My dad said, you're going to be a great fit for this. I said, I hate junior high kids. They hate me. This is an even exchange. Like this, this should not be like a, this should just be a no brainer for people. He said, no, I think you need to do this. And then again, you know, I was like, I'm never doing anything else but junior high ministry. From there, it, it evolved, high school, um, hyphen, college and career. And then whenever I was 19, um, I thank God for praying parents. I was pretty backslidden on the pew. I was going through a horrible transition in my life. Um, my youth pastor at the time had just left, and I felt so tied to him and his ministry, and they had they had gone to take a position in another church, and I just I felt myself just fading in between that the years of eighteen and nineteen. I would show up to church, but I was so disengaged. And my mom saw this, and she said, "I have an opportunity to go to the Philippines and do you know some women's events, and you're going to go with me." And I said, "Absolutely not. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not doing anything." I had a horrible attitude, and she said, "No, you are. You absolutely are coming to the Philippines with me." And I said, well, I'm going to miss college. Like, I, I can't just take three weeks off, you know, of a semester. I'm going to have to take a whole semester off in order to go. And she said, yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to come. Going you're with going me. with me. And um, she won. She won that battle. And I remember I got to the Philippines. And it wasn't my first time overseas. But it was my first time in a very vulnerable place overseas. And we went to Axe Bible School in Manila. Um, one of our friends, um, the the Mallorys, that is no stranger to Woodlawn, they spent a lot of time there. And the kids, the students, excuse me, they started singing. And I will never forget, I just found myself on the floor. And the Lord asked me, will you say yes one more time? And I said, yes, I will. And so that's, that's what started me. Um, on a journey in the Philippines. So I moved to the Philippines. I taught in that same Bible school that I had that, that experience with. And from there, 
um, people would ask me, uh, and, and people say this a lot, Pastor Jaron, they say, so do you feel called to that one place? And yes, I mean, from, from what I knew, I thought, yes, I'm called to the Philippines. You know, I, I only thought you could be called to one place until God put another couple in my life. And they said, would you consider just coming with us to this unknown nation, um, this nation that no apostolic has ever been in before? And I was like, I guess, you know, I mean, it's it's not Asia. It's not where I thought that I would be. I was like, sure, I guess you guys just need somebody to go. And they said, yeah, we, we need someone to come in and help us pray. And I'm like, so there's no church there? I said, no, there's there's no church there. And I said, have you ever been? They said, no, we've never been. Oh, my goodness. And so I said, okay, so so there's no known apostolics at, in this country. And um, and so we go, and I had no clue, like Pastor Jaren, I had no idea about the difference between Allah and and uh, Muhammad. I, 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 a simple Google search would have done me well. Like I had no clue about anything, anything, the difference between Muslim and Islam. Like I didn't, I didn't even know. I thought they were two separate things. I had no, I was so uncultured, uneducated on anything with the Middle East. And they asked me to, they asked me to come and I went and there God asked me to say yes again. Mm. And he said, well, will you say yes to people, loving people that America's predominantly racist against because of 9-11? Will you say yes to loving people wow. that there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world that don't know Christ? Will you say yes to just trying to go on a path and just loving them? And I said yes again. And that was what really started broadening my horizons. And I went back to that little cardstock paper when I was 14 years old at that conference in January of how a lot of times we want to step by step we want a we want a plan. We want to fit in this one category, and we want to try and fit God in this one lane of what He's going to do. But really, He just wants our yes. He just wants our obedience, and He can open up a world that we can't even imagine. That's so beautiful, and it's like a tape recorder that I'm I'm hearing today from just some conversations that I've had over the last few weeks, specifically since North American Youth Congress, mm-hmm. because. God did a great work there. He called so many young people and young adults into into ministry. And I've been literally rehearsing with them. you got to have a yes in your spirit. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter what it is. It may seem small and insignificant, but one yes leads to the next. Mm-hmm. Can you just expound on that in just a minute? Like, why do you think God works that way? Like, what 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 is it in your mind that when you when you say yes once— that doors just keep opening. You know, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to rack my brain for just to contrast like against the biblical encyclopedia that's that's inside of me, but it's the opposite is happening and I'm remembering a story of Brother Barnes who said that he, you know, in only the way that he could. He talked about how he could get done, he could get more done fasting in 3 days. Because every day he told himself no to something. Wow. So he said that fasting, of course, it was hard for his flesh, but he was already disciplined in a way of saying no to certain things, that fasting was not a constant struggle of saying no all day. And he said, I can, you know, I, only, only in the way he could. I can get more done in three days, you know, than, than, than I could in seven because I, I keep that discipline of no. So on the opposite side of that, the discipline of saying yes, it might have, you know, at 14 years old at that altar, if the Lord would have spoken to me and said, and you're going to go into Access Challenge Nations, and you're going to love Muslims, and you're going to eat dinner with terrorists, I absolutely would have yelled, no, "No." (laughs) absolutely not. I'm not doing that. But the tiny yeses built into medium yeses. And the medium yeses built into large yeses. Kendra, that's so rich. And now it's just, it's very easy. It's like, why would I not? Why would I not say yes? Mm. Well, you're an accomplished speaker, anointed, talented, gifted. But that is only a byproduct of your calling. And God has called you to, to missions. It's very evident 
on your life as as we follow you in your in your travels in your in your ministry. Give me give me some of your your craziest and wildest stories that you can in just a few moments, and then maybe just a faith filled story that you can encourage our listeners today of of what all of these small yeses have led to what you are experiencing now. So one of the craziest stories that it never seems crazy in the moment, like when when you're over there, and then when you get back to America, you kind of just sit, you know, like on your couch with a Coke, and you think, did that just happen? Did, did that actually just happen? We were in the Middle East. I was with a team, and um, we were going into a country slash territory that did not have an apostolic presence at that time. And we were just going in to pray because, Pastor Jaron, a lot of times in our denomination and in our faith, we feel that success is only measured by numbers. How many people, you know, come to Christ? How many people repent and and make a statement of faith, be baptized in Jesus' name, or they're filled with the Holy Ghost? I think a lot of times we can get really caught up in those statistics and, you know, those numbers like an Excel spreadsheet. And it's good. It's, it, it's good to keep track. It's good to be organized. It's good to have a plan. But success in the Middle East, success in the underground church, it doesn't look like numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. It looks like planting seeds of prayer. You know, Paul said, mm. you know, some some plant, some water, God gives the increase. And so that's we've really taken that to heart, and that's that's kind of our rule of thumb. So if we can get into a country and just pray and just declare the name of Jesus, that's a success. That's a win for us. Um, and if we can do it with no harm, um, <laughs> that's that's an even better. You better believe <laughs> that's it. even an even better day for us. And so we were going into this place just to pray, and I'll never forget we had to we had to hike down into this cave in order not to be heard. And it was uh, myself and a team of four men that were with us. It was just it was a quick day trip. And we hiked down into this cave just to pray. And we prayed probably for an hour. It was the most beautiful time of prayer. And um, we felt good about it. We got up out of the cave. We went. We had lunch. It was wonderful. And um, the representative, we, we don't say the word missionary, the, the representative that was guiding us said, hey, I want to take you guys over to this place. It's a great place to take pictures. And so we said, okay. So he took us over to this place to take pictures, and I was in the front seat. He was driving, and then the, some of the guys were in the back, and they got out to go and take pictures. And I was watching them. I didn't get out of the car, and I was watching them goof off, and they were they were headed over um, to, to the place to take pictures. And my head was turned to the right, and I said, oh, look, they're having so much fun. And as soon as I said that, I heard, and I, I saw smoke and and all kinds of chaos and ensuing just on the left side. And everything happened so fast but so slow at the same time. Um, the representative said, okay, this, is, the, the, this isn't good. This is a high-activity day. But in the, in the midst of all that chaos with um, different things happening, you know, we didn't know if, if we were being bombed. We heard gunshots. We heard all kinds of stuff. We didn't know exactly where anything was coming from. We didn't know if it was an airstrike or what was going on. Shopkeepers are pulling down their storefronts. Women are grabbing their children and and hiding them. And there's people coming and beating on the car door. And they're saying, get out of here. The fight's not with you. Get out of here. Kind Muslim people that are wanting us to get to safety. And that's totally not the narrative that we hear, you know. Yeah. And they're looking out for us, and they're trying to get us out. And um, we're separated from these guys. And so I'm, I'm praying like, God, we've got to get with these, we've got to get these guys. They've got to know which the chaos separated us. And so we're looking and we're seeing this smoke that's just coming from our left side and the roads are about to be blocked because they feel like the tanks are about to roll through. And we only have a very short time and a very short window to get over to this right side and, and get out of, of this place that we were in. So finally, the rest of the team realizes what's going on. They come, they jump in the back seat, and we we take off and we start going. And I don't know what it was about that moment, but it made me realize I, I felt like I was climbing the walls of that car because I just wanted to stay because there's kids, there's women, there's children, there's men that they wake up every day in war is their norm. It's their normal. Mm. 
and they don't know the name of Jesus. They don't know the refuge of Jesus. They don't know the power, the saving name of Jesus. And that was the only thing that kept coming through my mind. Like I'd, I was, I, I fought being a little hysterical. I was like, we can't just leave them here. Like we, like, are you kidding? We're leaving right now. Like we, we can't just leave them here. And so as we were, as we were driving out, I felt almost like I don't, I don't know if y'all have um, with your kids those those like Barbie jeeps, you know that. Oh yeah. Okay, I'm I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about, Pastor. It, it, I, and I know that, like, you know, as an adult, you can just kind of pick up the back of that Barbie Jeep and, and the kids will probably think that they're going really, really fast. It felt like God did that to the back of our car. And it felt like we just glided out of all of that disaster, all of that mess. And as soon as we crossed the border on the aux cord in the stereo, um, all the guys were just sniffling in the back. We were just trying to, we weren't saying anything. We were crying and trying to come to grips with what all we had just seen. And on the aux cord, we hear, Before me, behind me, mm. always beside me, no shadow, no valley, where you won't find me, no, I am not afraid. And we didn't say anything. And we just drove out of out of that place. We went to the safe place area where the representative lived. And, and um, we, we looked out over the city where we could kind of see in the distance that territory. And he said to us, he said, so how about it, guys? Who does God love more? Who does God love more? Does he love us more? Does he love the Muslims more? Does he love the Israelites more? Who does he love more? Who did he die for the most? Who? And we all just sat and we grappled and we understood. He just loves all of us. He loves all of us. And I felt like in that moment, God just imparted a love for all people to me. It was, it was like everything started getting real even at the foot of the cross there. So after that, um, I don't recommend this. PSA to anybody listening, I do not recommend taking taxis alone, especially if you're a female. I do not recommend this. Do not do as I say or as I do, or whatever, whatever is monkey say, monkey do, I don't even know. I do not recommend this. If you're listening, if you're underage, do not do this. Do not do what I have done. So the missionary puts me into a cab, and he says, um, can you can you get back to your hotel if we give him the address? I'm like, sure, I guess, you know. So he gives the address to this taxi driver, and I do not speak the language. I did not know where I was going. And I could tell that this taxi driver, this was probably his first ride ever. It might have been his first time driving a car. (laughs) Honest to God. He just, you know, I didn't have to speak the language to know that there's a universal sign of confusion. And, And this man was confused, and he was sweating, and he was shaking. And the missionary put me in the back seat, and he said, you going to be okay? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So they shut the door. And the cab driver, he's just white knuckles. He gripped the steering wheel, and he turned around in broken English, and he said, are we all here? And I think he's talking about, like, me and all of my emotional baggage for the day. And I said, yes, we are all here. Everybody is here. Uh, me and, and myself, we are all here. And so he starts driving. And as he's driving, I notice that he's looking over to his right, and then he's looking up in the back with the um, with the rearview mirror, he's looking up at me, and then he's looking beside me in the rearview mirror to my left. And he repeats, and then he looks at the road, and he repeats this process, white knuckled around the around the steering wheel, and he looks over right to his right in the passenger seat, looks up and down as if somebody's sitting there, and then he looks up in the rearview mirror at me, and then he looks beside me in the rearview mirror, and then he looks straight at the road. He repeats this process the whole the the whole drive, and I'm like, man, what is with this guy? I wasn't really thinking clearly. And so then we head off on this five-lane highway that is super busy, and I notice he's getting nervous and nervous and nervous, and he slams on his brakes, and he says, I stop here. And I said, oh, no, sir, you don't. No, sir. (laughs) No, no, sir, we are in the middle of a highway. There's horns honking, you know, and they're, they're, they're swerving in traffic. And I'm like, this is, this is how it ends after this whole day. This is how it ends right here, like a language barrier with a cab driver on the interstate. And I'm, I'm, we're about to get in a car accident. And I put my head down on the seat in front of me. And I said out loud, I didn't even care. I said, God, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I stink. 
I have been through a lot today. I have no, my phone doesn't work. I don't know how to get where I'm going. You've got to tell me where to go. And as sure as I'm sitting here, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, tell him to go to the end of this road and turn right. And I said, sir, go to the end of this road and turn right. And he said, no, I stop here. I said, no, sir, we're going to go to the end of this road and then we're going to turn right. And so he said, okay, so we go to the end of the road and he says, right, this way. I said, yes, right. And so we turn right. We get to another stop sign. I put my head on the seat and I said, okay, Lord, where do we go? He said, turn right again. We turned right again. This happened until I wound up in front of our hotel. And so we pull up outside of the hotel and I'm honestly, Pastor Jaron, it was just, I was so emotionally delirious, physically delirious. I really wasn't even clocking with what was going on. And when we pull up to the hotel, he reaches over almost comically like Looney Tunes. He reaches over his right side where nobody is and he opens up the door and he shoves it open. And then he looks up and he says, is everybody okay? And I said, yes, sir, we're fine. We are fine. And in my head, you know, my Southern, I'm like, he's got to get a big tip. You know, he's he's a poor guy. He's he's just real nervous. Checking on your emotions. Yes, yes, yeah. And so I open up the my door, my side door, and I get out, and I, I walk over to the front door that he opened where nobody was sitting, and I handed him a tip, and I said, thank you so much, you know. And there's probably still skid marks. on that pavement from where he just took off and I said man what is with that guy and so I went in the hotel I checked in I connected to wi-fi and my phone immediately buzzed and it was an intercessor from a church that I had attended and he said where are you there are two nine foot angels that I saw carrying a car through all of these bombs and all of this fire and all of this smoke and then it followed you out and then you got into another car and then these angels got in the car with you and that was that was the moment where I said okay God okay if I'll just say yes to where you want me to go if you just want me just to go pray I don't have to go and and be a big deal I don't have to preach somewhere. I don't have to have thousands of followers on Instagram. I don't have to do anything. If you'll just tell me where to go, not by my, not by power, but by your spirit, I'll, I'll do whatever. There's a cliche, Pastor, that I'm sure you've heard that we've heard, and I'm, I'm not against this cliche, but it says, you know, there's no safer place to be than in the will of God. And no more dangerous place to be than outside of the will of God. I lived that that day. Wow. I don't. I don't even know what else to say. I mean that that testimony, that experience just says it all. Like, I I, I do want to go back to the moment that you didn't want to leave the city. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to leave. You know, in the middle of the chaos and and the bombings and and that sort of thing. And you talked about who does who does God love more? Like mm-hmm. that's what it all boils down to. Like His love, mm-hmm. and your ministry. It embodies the love of Christ. If I and and, and I'm, that's not my job to sum up your life, but if I had to sum up where you are right now, is you are teaching your generation and the next generation, what true love looks like. Can you close this podcast today just by talking about your revelation of the love of God? I, um, I'm still learning that every day. I'm, I'm still learning that every day. I've been doing a study, an in-depth study on righteousness and what righteousness is and what it isn't. And I think a lot of people for a long time have thought that it had to do something with appearance, but it has to do with how we love and it has to do with how we reach. That's a whole other podcast. That's that's a whole other, um, something for a whole other time. Before, when I was 14, before that moment happened, many dark, depressing moments happened. And it was not any indication or any uh, byproduct of my parents. I have 
the most amazing parents, and I'm not paid to say that. Um, I, I mean it. They are the most amazing parents. I had some unfortunate things happen in my life um, in my teenage years, and I was a product of church hurt very, very early, so much so that I did have a suicide attempt whenever I was 12 years old. And that was during a time where depression was not a hot topic. Um, that that kind of stuff was just not talked about. It was looked at very, uh, mental health was looked at like, well, wow, what's, what's wrong with you? Is that just some cool word that you heard? Do you even know how to spell that? Do you even know what that means? And whenever I was 12, um, I, had, I, I had a moment where I thought I was going to take my life, and the angel of the Lord came up behind me as I was about to, um, to do that and spoke to me and said, there's going to be a day where you're going to look at 12-year-olds and you're going to be much, much older, and you're going to tell them that it's worth it to live and to live in my love. And I got angry, even at 12. And I said, God, how? How would, how would, how would you... How would you let me still hurt but promise that that one day, whenever I'm old, that it's it's going to be better? He said, I'm trying to tell you that at some point you will be healed from this. You will. And I don't know if this is necessarily right, but, Pastor, I have lived from that moment looking at people and seeing what if what if they're facing the darkest thing? that I faced? What if, what if they're really dealing with this? I never want anyone that comes into a church to ever feel the way that I felt, not one time. I never want any kid to feel alone. I never want even any adult to feel alone or, or out of sorts or just because they have all the great influences in their life or on paper they look like they should have it all together. I, I can, it's not that I have the superpower to see through it. It's just, it's just I know how God met me. Mm. I know how God met me at that one moment. And so that is what has fueled just my love for people with, with student ministry because I never want anyone to feel that darkness that I felt and it will drive me to do the craziest things. I, and I, I just had this conversation with my mom. We have an excellent relationship with our doctor's office right now. That's a whole separate podcast. It's a wonderful testimony. But I walked in, and, and the doctor even told me, he said, I don't, I don't even know what it is about you, but you're the first patient that's walked in here and pretended that we just knew each other our entire lives. And I just, I just said, yeah, because somehow God has just imported this filter in my brain that we're all family. And I'm not trying to be hippie by saying that, you know, like peace, love, and chicken grease. That's not what I'm saying right now. I'm just saying, you know, we are all family. And if they're not technically in the family of God, I want them to be. So why don't we just practice right now? Wow. And so I just, I, my, my mom and I, we talked, and that's what we try to do. We try and treat everybody like they're family. Like we've known each other forever because everybody wants to belong somewhere. And if you're listening to this podcast right now and you live in Columbia, Mississippi or Hattiesburg, Mississippi or somewhere around, I'm telling you, you will not find a more warmer family of God than Woodlawn. And you do belong here. You do belong here. Thank you for loving people. Thank you for having me. You've been a blessing to this podcast today. Thank you for joining us. I, you know what? The stories. They, they, they said it all today. And uh, I just want your faith to be enriched and blessed. We pray blessings upon your church, your ministry, your business, wherever you find yourself today listening to this podcast. Make this your best day yet. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you've gained some insight into Woodlawn and trust there have been things you can use to further the kingdom at your local church. Make plans to join us next time. If you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. Send your comments and questions to podcast at woodlawnchurch.cc.